Uh, okay, got it. I think it works. We're live. Okay, that was quick. Okay, let's give it one more uh, minute just so that I can get ready over here. Okay, great. I see it live also. Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, our Safari Live seminar uh, today. Uh, we're going to uh, have a, a nice talk by uh, Dr. Sudan Gurumurthy uh, from AMD. He's going to talk about HBM3, reliability, availability, serviceability, and the journey to enhance and dine stack DRAM resilience at scale. Uh, Sudanwa is a fellow uh, at Advanced Micro Devices. Uh, he leads the advanced development in RAS, reliability, availability, and serviceability. Prior to joining industry, uh, Sudanwa was an associate professor with tenure at the University of Virginia Computer Science Department. And he received a bunch of awards uh, during that time and afterwards. Uh, I will not name all of them, but the NSF Career Award uh, is one of them. Uh, awards from companies is another one. And he served as uh, the editor of IEEE Micro Top Picks and uh, different journals. And he serves on the program committees of many computer architecture conferences. Uh, he received his uh, PhD in computer science and engineering from Penn State in 2005. Uh, and uh, his PhD was on tolerating errors at that time also, I remember uh, reading his papers at the time. Uh, so we're going to have a seminar uh, describing uh, what uh, his team has been doing on HBM3 REST. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, I think we would like to keep it interactive. So if you have any questions on YouTube, you can put it on live chat. If you have any questions on Zoom, you can put it on chat. Uh, or if you're so inclined, you can also uh, speak up if you're on Zoom. And we'll try to bash the questions and uh, stop Sutama at appropriate points uh, when it makes sense to ask the questions. Okay, with that, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Sudanma. Sudanma, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Honor. Thank you for the opportunity. And hello, everybody, uh, wherever you may be. I'll say good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, right. So, and again, as uh, Professor Motlu said, feel free to ask questions whenever you feel like, you know, hey, I you need to get something clarified. I, what was that or anything, right? Okay. Um, so, Let's see, let me make sure I can advance the slides. And before I get into the talk, I would like to acknowledge a bunch of people. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues at AMD, as well as at um, uh, SK Hynix and Samsung, with whom uh, we collaborated quite extensively to bring this work uh, to fruition. So you know, I'd like to thank all of them before I begin. Um, so just to explain a little bit about the title, there are a few term, terms there which may be unfamiliar. So HBM it stands for JetX High Bandwidth Memory. So HBM3 is the next generation of it, um, and it's expected to be widely used at scale. And what this talk is going to be about is the resilience aspects of it. And if you look at the title, it says journey. So the way the talk will be structured really is, is to sort of walk everybody here in the talk chronologically through sort of what was the problem statement, how did we approach it, certain you know, uh, things we had to handle and you know, the, the end result, right? So it really is a journey that I'm you know, um, taking everybody on on how we approached it and how we ended up where we are, right? Uh, with quantitative results to show along the way, right? Uh, hence the title. So the way the, the, the presentation is structured is, I'll first introduce you some, uh, I'll, I'll explain the context for the work um, with some broad industry trends, as well as define some terminology like RAS, which was mentioned a few times, like what does RAS mean and a few other uh, key terminology um, so that we are all on the same page about you know, the words I'll be using as we go along. Then I'll talk about some um, DRAM reliability trends as well as sort of set the problem statement of this work, right? Um, then I'll get into the specifics of HBM and specifically for HBM3 and explain why did we do the work that was done um, uh, as an industry. Um, and then, you know, finally, I'll talk about how did we practically get to an ECC or a RAS design for HBM3. And then I'll wrap up um, and, you know, point to some papers that you can read to get some more details about everything I'm going to talk about today. Right. 
So let me set some context for the work, right? So if you look, so, so the context here are a few key trends that we see in industry. First, we see a push, we have, we have seen a push towards increased heterogeneity at the node level. So you have CPUs, as well as various kinds of accelerators like you know, uh, GPUs and FPGAs um, interconnected together, right? Second, you see that we see um, a trend towards a tight integration between compute and memory. So this is where HPM comes in, right? So HPM, um, effectively, the, the HPM is so tightly integrated that it's effectively part of the SOC itself. And that provides all kinds of benefits in terms of you know, bandwidth and you know, latency and energy efficiency, and minimizing data movement and things like that. And finally, as we have seen, there's an ever greater push towards building larger systems and scaling out the size of these infrastructures for all the great workloads that, you know, that are run at scale today, right? And if you look at all of these trends, these trends, um, like you know, these broad industry trends have been enabled by various industry standards and are driving industry standards to be able to, you know, um, to support these kinds of technologies and at scale, right? So really this is where industry standards comes in that it really is a driver for change as well as having a lot of different options which brings together certain kinds of benefits that is seen as a, as a good for all, right? Um, and to make a case in point, if you look at, let's just say just HPC system. So in this table, right? So each of the columns of the table are a different supercomputer system, right? Starting from like, you know, more than a decade ago to um, Frontier, which is the exascale supercomputer, which you know, which uh, went live recently, right? And so each of the rows of the table corresponds to different figures of merit, such as you know, um, what kind of cores did they have? How many cores did they have? How much memory did they have? Uh, how much memory do they have? And the scale of the system in terms of node counts, right? So if you look at Jaguar, which was you know 2009-ish, it's a CPU-based system. It's all DDR-based. That's the only kind of memory. But as we have seen the evolution of these systems over time, we see that you know you, you have more types of memory in the system. Uh, you see HBM coming, you know, starting to get used as well, um, and you see that you know there's much larger amounts of memory capacity um, per com per you know compute unit, as well as in you know, a fairly large system size, right? Um, just to make a case in point. Now. To, 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 to enable all of these trends that are at this kind of scale, obviously there are many things one has to get right, like you know, performance, energy efficiency, and so on. But the other, one of the key pillars what, that we also need at scale is resiliency, right? And there are many reasons for it. One, at the silicon level, there can be many things, um, uh, you know, there can be all kinds of faults that can happen in silicon from you know, particle strikes, uh, transient falls, permanent falls, you know, aging issues. There's a bunch of things that one has to um, cope with. Um, and um, so you have to cope with it from, you know, from an SOC perspective, but also, you know, you have a very large component count of these systems at scale, right? So the errors which could arise from these falls could disrupt the normal execution, could disrupt the thing that you're trying to use that compute infrastructure for, and as you have larger and larger scale, the frequency of these events grows, uh, grows, right? So one has to design for resiliency in order to cope with these effects and, and be able to do useful work with these systems, right? So, so that's sort of why we need resiliency. So resiliency really is, this is where the term RAS comes in, right? It's really three different components. And there's an R, there's an A, and there's an S. So R stands for reliability. It's the ability to provide correct service. Availability means the ability to be ready to provide correct service. So the way to think about availability is an error has happened. How do you still keep going in the presence of that, um, that, that error which has happened, right? Um, reliability, you, know, you can think of reliability as like, how do you minimize errors from happening or be able to prevent them from do causing, you know, a fault from causing an error? And then the third angle is serviceability, is the ability to diagnose and repair uh, faults that have happened, right? So these are fairly abstract terms at this point in the talk, but I wanted to define them because as we go on in this journey, I will show you how each of these things figures in some concrete way into the architecture and how, uh, how to address them. And really the way to think about it is, R is important, A is important, S is important, 
But really, it's the three things which go together, right? So RAS is important, which means that anything you do in terms of architecture or system design really has to take into account all three aspects and be able to provide um, a solution which you know really addresses all three. And we will get to this point um, in a few slides, right? So, so another two terms which I want to define clearly are two terms which sound like synonyms, which is fault and error, but they really mean two different things, right? So fault is, is the thing that went wrong, right? It's the condition that causes the inability to meet specifications. Um, so for example, if there's like a particle strike and you know it flips a bit, you know, that's the fault, right? That's the event where you know you 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 know you you flipped a bit, which you shouldn't have flipped, right? And faults can be classified as transient, permanent, or intermittent based upon you know how the, you know what they actually do um, in in terms of um, um, you know its effect uh, on on where they happen, right? The error is the manifestation of the fault, right? Um, and from a design perspective, like as a computer architect, from a hardware design perspective. Um, obviously both are important, but understanding false is the thing that is more important because you need to understand what is going wrong in order to, in order to reason about what to do about it, right? But of course, errors are important as well because they cause disruption, especially they cause disruption as your scale goes up. So if you look at modern servers across industry today, right? You have a set of capabilities which are targeted around managing faults and targeted around managing errors, right? So for example, um, what fault management things do is like the, the, the goal there is to pinpoint where faults happen and do something about it. An example of this uh, fault management scheme is uh, DRAM page retirement or page offlining. So the idea is if you can pinpoint there's some, you know, some bits or some group of physical addresses where you're having faults, let's say a permanent fault, and you don't want to use it again, you just offline that page so that the OS never um, maps any um, any page there, right? So that's a specific capability, um, um, you know, which, um, you know, which hardware needs to uh, support in order for system software to use it, right? There are many such things in the, you know, which are used in practice today. Um, error management, the idea there is like, you know, um, so if an error has happened, how do you reduce the impact of that? Like, for example, an example of that is a, you know, it's a technique known as data poisoning, where if you have, let's say, an uncorrected error in some location, um, you, pr you, you, you propagate what is known as a poison through the SOC to some, you know, always visible boundary. And depending on which physical address was impacted, maybe you kill the process, you don't bring the whole node down, right? So it, you know, it helps with your availability, for example. And again, there's a whole slew of error management techniques, which are used, some of which enabled by hardware or implemented in hardware, some of which enabled in software, used as best practices across industry, right? But the key thing um, is that to do any of these kinds of things, right, you really need a high degree of transparency of, of, of errors um, and faults um, happening in, in at the lowest levels in the system, right? So if there are errors happening in hardware or faults, uh, uh, it, it, there needs to be, transparency of those events to, to where these management um, entities reside in your system. I will come to this point in a little bit because it's really important and how you architect hardware or RAS uh, at the hardware level in order to enable these things, right? So these are some you know basic terminology, right? False errors, error, transparency, um, right, and RAS. So I'll start using these terms um, going forward. So let's talk about, so this is an HBM3 talk. HBM3 is a type of DRAM. So let me talk a little bit about DRAM, right? So um, if you look at a DRAM chip or a DRAM die, right? What, you, and if you sort of, you know, uh, zoom into it, right? There are many different, I mean, if you, in generally you'll see like, you know, DRAM max, which have, and you know, where you have your bit lines and word lines, intersections of which you have your, you know, your DRAM cells, right? And you have a hierarchy of interconnect Right, so you have, for example, main word lines tapping off of which are sub word lines, and you have various contact points and drivers, sense amplifiers, and so on. Right, so to, if you ask the question as to where could faults happen in DRAM, right, there are many different places where a fault could happen. Right, you could have a fault in a, in your own DRAM cells. Right, 
or you could have a fault in something like a sense amplifier. And typically these will these would manifest um, as a fault in a single bit or a single column. If you look at, for example, if you decode your row bank column addresses, physical addresses, these could show up as a single bit fault or a single column fault, for example. Um, you could have a fault happening in one of these shared interconnects, right? For example, let's say you had a fault at this contact point of a, you know, of a subboard line driver, right? Um, you know, you could, it, this will manifest itself as a row fault. It'll look as if a bunch of bits have errors in them, right? Um, it, it, it not necessarily mean that the pixels have all gone bad. It means that, you know, some shared, you know, some shared point has had some fault, right? Or it could happen at a higher level in this hierarchy, right? So you could have, let's say you had a failure in a main word line contact. It could look as if a very large number of bits within a DRAM bank have gone bad, right? So theoretically, all these kinds of faults can be seen um, if you if you start you know measuring the kinds of faults which happen in DRAM. But the question again from an engineering perspective is like you know there is theory and what is really happens in practice, right? So quite often when you're trying to in an engineering setting trying to make improvements, the question really is what does the data tell us where things are happening and where there are opportunities for improvement and you know where the um, so I would say the greatest opportunities are there for improvement. So to answer that question, um, um, right? So in, at, at, at the company at AMD, for more than 10 years, we have actually been collecting data uh, at scale from production systems, DRAM field data, right? And we have published several papers about this um, over these last uh, decade or so, right? So we and, and and all of these have been really excellent collaborations with our with our customers to you know to partner with them to you know get the data, understand the data, analyze the data jointly, and then uh, share our results with the broader technical community, right? So if you look at the data, right? So in this graph, the x-axis are different DDR memory systems, right? Starting from DDR2, two systems which are DDR3, some GDDR5 data, right? Um, and the y-axis, and so each one of these stack bar graphs shows you the proportion on a per device basis, right? The proportion of each of these kinds of fault boundaries that we have seen, right? So, so if you take this DDR2 bar, right? So it's like you know, roughly 50% of the faults were single bit faults, a little bit more than that were column faults and you know, word faults. Then we had some you know, row faults and then bank faults and you know, faults which may be multi-bank natures, right? So we've been able to collect this kind of data at scale or long periods of time from these production systems, right? So the, the it, roughly, if you look at it, the x-axis is really time, right? It's really a proxy for time. It's also a proxy for DRAM technology scaling, right? Over over this time period, right? Um, so there's a lot of different trends that you can see from the data, right? So you see that there's a good number of these single bit faults which have been happening repeatedly from one DRAM generation to another to another. Um, but we also see that all these DRAM generations have been experiencing not just single bit faults, but also multi bit faults, right? Um, I'm actually going to prefetch a question, which 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 people may ask here, saying, "Hey, DDR3 is kind of old, right? You know, what about newer DRAM technology?" So I'll sort of give you a prefetched answer there. We also do have data at volume for DDR4. We just haven't published it. Generally, the trends we see are similar to our DDR3 data set at the very high level. Um, right, so we see single bit falls, but a bunch of these, um, um, you know, row falls as well, right? And then, you know, some amount of these larger than row falls as well, right? But the key point we've seen is that we see a consistent trend over time that, um, you know, you do have these multi-bit falls and, you know, we have to, we have to understand it and do something about it, right? Um, so this is a false statement, right? This is not an error statement. Now. How do you normal? How how does how do we normally deal with this? Right in DRAM, the normal way we deal with this is through error correcting codes, right? ECC schemes, right? Um, and if you look at DDR based um, systems, right, which is you know used in servers uh, in quite a bit, right? The gold standard ECC is the Chipkill ECC, right? It goes by different names um, across industry, but um, so so the idea is in, in a DDR memory system, right? Um, as several people on this call know who are you know, DRAM experts, right? Every DRAM device contributes a small amount of the data on a cache line fetch. 
So it's really a parallel transfer across all these data devices, which gets you the cache line. And you add a couple of these ECC devices and the what the chip kill ECC algorithm does, which is a very powerful property, is that it can tolerate a fault of any size, any number of bits from any one DRAM device within your rank, right? By adding these extra DRAM de uh, ECC devices and you know using an appropriate type of ECC algorithm, right? And that is extremely powerful because what that means is that all that, that stack bar I showed you in that previous graph, no matter what the fault boundary is, as long as it's written one DRAM device, everything is correctable, right? And that's but that's very valuable when you have you know, large, very large amounts of memory deployed at scale in these servers, right? Now, the issue is, this is where we come to the problem statement for, for HBM3, if you look at the HBM architecture, right? The data acts, because of the virtue of the, of the die stack DRAM architecture, the way a cache line access is done is different. So, so in DDR, right, every DRAM device contributes some of the bits, right? And it's really accessing them across all the devices in this ganged um, manner. So in HBM, what you do is if you're fetching a cache line, you go to a, you know, to a layer, right? Uh, to a specific layer in your die stack, you go to your specific bank and you read the entire cache line from that bank, right? So when you, and that's what gives you the efficiency of the high bandwidth, right? So you can have a very large number of, you know, memory transactions in flight. Um, and, you know, that gives you the benefits that HBM gives you for all the workloads and, uh, that it's used for in you know, various SOCs, right? So that makes a chip kill like algorithm really difficult because if you have, you're fetching it from one boundary, where do you add these extra check bits to, to, to protect an entire cache line worth of data being fetched, right? So, so this is a research question which the research community has um, explored, right? There have been a bunch of papers on this on how do you improve the, you know, the, 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 um, the, uh, the, the ECC capabilities of a die stack DRAM architecture. And there've been a lot of ideas which are like RAID-like ideas where you take a cache line, you split it across, let's say different physical boundaries like bands or between, you know, across layers, um, multiple dies, right? And then do the fetch. Now the problem is um, with all of those schemes is that they impact either power or performance or you know, it's the design complexity in a way that makes them impractical, um, you know, in a sense to be able to standardize in a broad industry setting. Right? Those are all very interesting papers, right? Um, but uh, you know, it's really it is just those schemes really did not, you know, cannot, are not directly applicable in a practical way, right? Um, so which sort of leads us to the next point is like how do we actually do it? Right, like how do like how do we actually address it, and do we really need to address it? Right. So, so which moves to the next part, which is why did we why do we want a stronger ECC? Why did we want it in HBM three? Let me try to explain. Set that set that um, you know the, the context for it. So the baseline for HBM three is the previous generation HBM two, right? Um, and HBM two in the memory specification, right? Uh, it's a 256-bit uh, access, right? It's a, you're fetching 256 bit, uh, bits um, at a time from your HBM. And the spec, the specification gives you 32 check bits for doing a host ECC, right? The spec doesn't tell you what to do with those ECC bits, right? It tells you you have 32 bits, right? And if you look around sort of, um, you know, if you sort of look around, you know, industry generally with HBM2, the way those 32 check bits gets used is to implement um, an error correcting code, which gives you a single error correction capability with some, you know, the ability to maybe detect multi-bit faults, right? So that was the baseline we started with in, in sort of the journey uh, of trying to, you know, address HBM, of, of trying to, you know, um, uh, explore um, whether we need a better RASP HBM3 and what do we need to do, right? So what we did is that we modeled um, an HP, you know, sort of a representative HPC style node, and we what we did is we we uh, we varied uh, the the number of nodes in a system with such kind of a node, and estimated what would be the uncorrected MTBF mean time between failures um, at the system at the full system level with nodes like that. So what we did is we have the field data, right? So that gives us the statistics of um, you know what kinds of faults happen. Um, what is the fault rate at which uh, that we have seen? 
as well as you know what proportion of them are like single bed, single column, row, for, row, whatever, right? So then we can basically use that information to reason about if you have an ECC, which is a single error correction ECC, what can it correct and what can it not correct, right? And that's the end result of that is what this graph shows, right? So again, with the y-axis, you want these points to be as high as possible because you want your uncorrected errors to be as infrequent as uh, as you as possible at scale, right? Because errors cause disruption. So if you look at this graph, right? If you, as you increase the number of nodes in the system, your MTBF comes down. Right, so if you when you reach this ten thousand node uh, system, right, so that is the ball, that is roughly the um, uh, the ballpark for where you know large HPC systems of today are, right, and once you go beyond that hundred k nodes or so, right, that's the realm of you know your large cloud infrastructures and things like that, right. So when you come to this ten thousand node, you what you end up with is you know a few uncorrected memory errors per um, um, you know per, like a few per day. Once you get to this 100,000 nodes, you get several uncorrected um, memory errors um, with this ECC configuration on a per day basis, right? So clearly it sort of showed that, you know, um, you know th th that's what the ECC gives you and, you know, improvements are, um, you know, would, 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 would be nice to have, especially when you have large scale systems, you would like to be able to push these points higher, right? And then where they are, right? Um, so, you know, it seemed like there's a good motivation to do it. Um, but in this time frame, where you know HPM three um, and so on, right? There are and, and, and th there are a number of newer DRAM problems also to deal with, and sort of clubbing them together under this moniker of a DRAM scaling fault, right? So, for example, let me pick a couple of these which uh, have been you know uh, uh, which, which get talked about, right? So, one is variable retention time falls. This is a telegraph telegraph noise um, where you know your retention time can randomly go from up from down to high, right? And these are you know increasingly challenging to just screen out. You know, again, I'm sort of you know um, you know in, in working with the memory industry, I've uh, understood that these are increasingly challenged to just all screen out um, during the manufacturing. And and again, I should give credit here to the research community, right? So th these these kinds of falls are not new. In fact, you know, Professor uh, uh, Mutlo's group themselves have published papers on how one may deal with these kinds of faults, right? So there are ideas like variable rate refresh schemes and combining them at ECC and so on. So there are a lot of ideas out there, but things like variable rate refresh schemes, again, these are um, challenging for a sort of a broad industry practical adoption. At least, you know, they were, you know, they, they, you know so they, they, it's, uh, you know, there are lots of good ideas out there, but, you know, Again, they were they were deemed challenging for practical adoption. Again, there are things like write recovery uh, time falls, where in a write recovery time keeps on going up with scaling. Um, you know, you could do some things like increasing internal parallelism, but uh, but generally, the memory industry again acknowledged that these are emerging problems which are going to happen um, in this time frame of something like HPM3 going out um, into the market. So the solution driven by the memory industry. Right, is to use this notion of an in DRAM ECC, uh, sometimes also known as an on die ECC. Right, so this is an ECC engine which is inside your DRAM. Quite often, your ECC is outside. Right, it's a host thing, um, like an HPM2. Right, so your your ECC engine is sitting on your host uh, memory controller, not inside your DRAM. But the solution really, which has been driven by the industry in um, to to cope with these kinds of scaling issues which are happening, is this idea of an in DRAM ECC. Um, and for example, DDR5 has a single error correcting DRAM ECC, LPDDR has had it as well, right? So it's a, it's a general industry trend. So the starting point, again, for HPM3, um, when we began this work where, where industry was thinking about where in, to take HPM3 is that HPM3 is, was, go, was going to have an in-DRAM ECC. It was going to look a lot like this uh, DDR5 style in-DRAM ECC, which is a single error correct. In DRAM ECC. Um, and generally, if you look at the check bits requirements for doing that, it's, you need 16 check bits uh, to do you know, for this in DRAM ECC for this 256 bit patch, right? So, this was the original glide path, right? Um, so, we wanted to understand what the implications of that design is before we did anything, right? So, the, the way to we, we thought about it is as follows, right? So, 
the single error, single error correct ECC, right? It can correct a single bit or single column fault, right? Now, if you don't have any DRAM scaling faults, the the capability of that ECC will look just like that graph I showed, you know, a couple of slides ago, right? That's that's what you'll get at scale. Everything else is uncorrectable. But now you have a new problem, right? So you have these faults that we have seen in the field for quite some time. Let me just call them like nominal DRAM faults, right? These happen due to things like, for example, aging issues and things like your subboard line drivers and contacts and things like that. Now you also have DRAM scaling faults. You have an additional source of faults that could happen in your DRAM. Now, if you have, and, and, and these faults were deemed to you know, mostly be single bit faults, right? Um, these DRAM scaling faults. Now each one of them individually could be correctable by a SEC ECC, but with, within one code word, if you have an overlap of a nominal DRAM fault, single bit or single column, and a DRAM scaling fault, now you have a two bit fault. This becomes an uncorrectable uh, fault um, from with a SEC ECC code, right? And we wanted to estimate um, under what conditions would this happen? How and how bad could it be? How like what if you have a SEC ECC? What could happen when these scenarios happen, right? And we did this um, analytically, right? Uh, and this shows the result. Um, I, again, let me I can maybe explain a little bit for those who are interested in how this was done. Um, right, so so you really you're 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 used we use the field data as statistics, right, um, to to um, to tell us basically you can from that you can essentially derive like what proportion of different kinds of faults happen in different fault boundaries, right? We in working and collaborating with the memory industry, we know the different we know the internal structure of your HBM3 die, like you know where are the how many banks do you have. How many rows per bank, right? You, you you can then you have the physical boundaries there, you have the statistics on how these nominal DRAM faults happen, right? Using that, we can then essentially um, you know uh, compute the probability of what is the overlap between a scaling fault with a nominal fault or these fault boundaries, right? We can mathematically model that using the statistics, the field data that we have, right, and the DRAM design. So this is where actually it was a nice collaboration. Um, that we were able to do because we had data, you know, like the memory industry brings expertise on the DRAM design. So we worked on this together. Um, and this graph shows uh, the, um, the result of that um, an analysis, right? So the x-axis of this graph is the number of weak cells in the DRAM die that we vary as an input in this analysis, right? And the y-axis is the uncorrected um, uh, error rate uh, per for one DRAM die um, expressed in fit or failures in time. So fit is the is a is a rate based metric, right? It's defined as uh, one uh, failure every billion hours is what it's defined as, right? Um, so again, higher the fit, um, higher is the rate in which you fall. So you want the fit numbers to be low, right? So this blue line is the um, you know the you know the fit rate you would get with the SEC ECC, right? The glide path into HBM three. And you know, just as a reference point, right? The Chipkill ECC, the gold standard in DDR, um, it, 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 an overlap between a DRAM scaling fault and a nominal fault, as long as it's in one DRAM device, it's all correctable, right? So the fit is effectively zero. Just as a just to sort of make the point, right? Um, as an aspirational design point, right? So so really, we varied it from like zero to 32k weak cells, and that's really a minuscule portion as a capacity of a of a of a DRAM die, right? But you know, again, we varied as an input um, over this, you know, the makers call it region of interest, right? So we see two observations from this graph, right? So there is already like a gap, pretty big gap between, you know, um, um, you know, what Chipkill could have given you if this was a DDR system, and you know, the SEC ECC. This is the same gap we quantified in a different way in that previous graph, right? But as the number of weak cells on the die goes over, you know, a few hundreds, right? This blue line gets even farther away from the orange line, right? So that overlap probability keeps on growing. So what that happens is what could have it, you, you now have more and more uncorrectable errors because of this overlap between a weak cell which is activating essentially this um, scaling fault um, and um, you know these nominal faults which we have always seen happen in the field, right? So. Given that these deep scaling falls are, you know, are going to be a reality in this time frame of, you know, HBM three and the other falls, 
you know, every generation after another in DRAM, we are seeing them. We needed to do something about the ECC architecture in HPM3, at least to bring this blue line back, but back towards where it was in HPM2, but preferably bring the blue line closer to this orange line, right? To in order to you know provide better resilience at scale, right? So clearly there was a motivation to that there was a problem, uh, motivation to solve a problem, right? Hey, Sudanva. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe I have I have a bunch of questions, but I'll I'll start with asking one. This is very interesting data for sure. Uh, I think one one question is related to understanding uh, what you are plotting here. When you say weak cells, are these the cells that are subject to variable retention time failures, or does it include other cells that may potentially have issues? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would say um, we didn't we didn't initially the way we initially did this analysis was to try to look at every fault mode individually, right? That got a little bit. Um, untenable, right? Mm -hmm. So instead what we said is we club together, uh, I would say the whole family of DRAM scaling faults mm -hmm. um, as, as a single thing. And we just said, okay, there are weak cells which could be causing any different type of DRAM scaling faults. As long as these are all faults, which would be a single bit fault when they you nasty know, appear. And this is where the expertise of the memory designers came in, right? Is to understand what kinds of faults actually will manifest itself as a single bit fault, right? And there are a set of these things under which which were the same falls for which the Indira ECC was being targeted, right? Mm -hmm. So so I'm sort of abstracting them as um, as just weak cells which can cause a DR, a single bit DRAM scaling fault. Behind the covers, from a device physics viewpoint, there are more than one root cause for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. So so and we wanted to really see is the sec Indira ECC good enough or not, and in which cases are they good enough, in which cases are they not good enough. And the key thing we got here is that very quickly it becomes not good enough, right? Because even with like, like let's say, where is this curve taking off? Like five, twelve, you no know, one K cells, right? It's taking off. That is, you know, nothing for a sixteen gigabit DRAM die, right? That's um, right. So, so the baseline itself was not, you know, we, you know, we saw a problem there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. Okay, uh, so it's really a family of uh, faults uh, that are clubbed together as uh, weak, uh, weak cells. Uh, one related question is uh, maybe I'll have more questions on this later, so we'll, uh, we can save the longer discussion for later. But I, I'm assuming you're not including uh, access pattern dependent faults like row hammer uh, here, right? Yeah, I, I was just waiting for when the row hammer question will come. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, so that is not included in this analysis, right? So okay. this whole talk is not included, right? Mm -hmm. So we are looking, so that's, a, I would say, a different root cause, right? Mm -hmm. And as you said, it's access pattern dependent, right? So, and it's not just a reliability thing, that's also a security thing, right? Mm -hmm. So this work did not account for that explicitly, right? But what I can sort of broadly say is that there is, like in JEDEC, there is a working group for, for Rowhammer and there are a set of, let me just call it, other sets of techniques which are being scoped you know, jointly by the broader industry to address that, right? Mm -hmm. So as you know, so AMD is definitely in that and we are using all the best practices from that, right? But this work, this work, and I would say this talk is not, um, is not, you know, it's not, doesn't touch on Rohammer explicitly. Right? Yeah, I understand. It makes sense uh, since it's a different root cause, as you said, right? it's access yeah. pattern dependent, which where ECC doesn't make as much sense uh, to employ. Well, one last question on this, maybe others have questions also, but, uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm curious why the chip kill ECC is always flat. I mean, I have a, I, I understand. I guess you're looking at only a single DRAM die. That may be the reason. But what if errors start happening in multiple dies at the same time? Yeah, yeah, that's a fair question. So yeah, for this graph, it's at zero just because it's a single die uh, mm -hmm. comparison, right? So mm -hmm. if you look at the field data that we have published, right? So we have published data on, um, I would say, like you know, fault boundaries of a chip and you know, um, falls across more than one chip, right? Um, so what we have seen, again, from the field, right, um, is that the vast majority, like a very, almost most of the data we have seen have been falls in the field where it's always been a single chip fall, right? Again, this is what the statistics has been telling us, right? And, you know, we have, all, I mean, we always, you know, keep checking if that is what holds true. Uh, again, we have, you know, um, you know, we get inputs from our own customers and things like that, right? So statistically, what we have seen is that that is the case. Um, so 
chip kill is an you know is a great ECC code because you do see a lot of things happening within a single chip. To be able to correct that is a extremely valuable thing in scale, right? Um, going beyond that, at least in, in the data we have published so far and that we have seen, right? We have you know we, we have we have not seen let's say an escalation in the multi-chip fail fault modes in a in a rank, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. If others have questions, they can. This is a good time to ask. Yeah, it's a good time to ask questions. Yeah, I have one actually. Uh, maybe it's, it's too much detail, but why do the error count for uh, SEC, um, SEC, ECC uh, start to plateau after 16K here? And do, do we expect the curve to follow the same trend afterwards? Um, yeah, I mean, so b basically what happens, right? It's um... It's, it's, it's not, it's plateauing in the sense that the overlap probabilities as you increase it, right? It's, um, it, it, it's, it's just a way, it's the statistic, it's a, it's a common, it's really the math, it's just really how it works out, right? It's not really, um, so the way the math really is done, right, is that you have a, so it, it's, it's really a Bernoulli uh, trial, right? So the overlap of a DRAM scaling fault and a regular fault uh, is considered a success event, otherwise it's a failure event, right? And what you're really computing, so it's, it's a Bernoulli trial, and what you're really computing is the binomial probability mass function of, um, if, of you know, at least uh, two errors upon a DRAM fetch, right? So really, it's really the two things happening, right? One is um, the boundaries, like how many rows per bank, right? So the, the, the bound, default the boundaries of a DRAM die are essentially your trials. Um, in your binomial, and the the probability the the probability of success of any one trial is really from the statistics in the field data, right? And so the the saturation really happening is really the function of the fact is that the boundaries are a fixed number, the probabilities uh, for any 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 for each fault mode is really a fixed number, and then you're really um, you're really it's like the 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 number of weak cells on the die really are. Well, they are they are also controlling the number of trials, right? So the question is, you know, for every weak cell you throw at it, what is the probability which is coming? It is just really the math, right? It is um, it it just sort of saturates at a at a high number, which just sort of says after a certain point, um, you are correcting certain faults, right? It's not like you are correcting zero faults, but the total number of correctable fault comes down and then sort of settles into a certain number for this range of numbers considered, right? It's just it's just the it's just that simple math. Yeah, I, I think I think I understand now. Thanks. And and then maybe another question is the uh, okay. Where do you expect to see the like the first? I mean, I don't know if they're built yet, but the first HBM three chip would lie on this screen, like the, in terms of number of weak cells on the DRAM die. Where do you expect it to? Um, so as we go on in the talk, you will sort of see that it's. Um... The architecture gives you some flexibility to, to not worry about that too much. Um, but I would say that the x-axis of this graph was a region of interest, right? Um, beyond that, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And again, this kind of studies happen, I mean, the math itself is easy, right? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a simple balls and buckets problem, which you see a lot in DRAM and ECC studies. But the key thing here really was the fact is that to parameterize these numbers properly, um, to set up the, the model, right, uh, was really where, you know, good collaboration between us and the memory industry was key, right? Because otherwise you can draw any graph with any numbers, but it's really to know where, where is the, how do you focus this on where it really, it's to, to zone in on where the, re, you know, the region of interest, right? So. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on a little bit and then I will take a pause again. So, all right, so the road to a practical HBM3 ECC, right? So again, to sort of um, set the baseline, right? So the original glide path, let me just synthesize a few things I talked about, right? The original glide path for HBM3 looked like this. So you have the HBM3 um, die, right? Uh, you have a bunch of these dies in a stack, so it's like you're looking up, looking at it from the top, right? So it's going, it's going to have a single error correct in DRAM ECC, right? Um, it the 
and you you would um, so so again and you'll send some of the unused check bits to the host for the host TCC. So the idea was the host TCC check bits will look a lot. It'll basically be like HPM two. So you get thirty two check bits at the host, 16, 16 check bits for the Indira ECC. So your total your total budget, um, which was considered a practical budget of forty eight check bits overall for you know the ECC scheme. The the sec ECC Tariff is internal to the DRAM. The host does not know what is going, what it's doing, right? It's uh, totally internal to the DRAM. To uh, the goal was it to 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 mask out these DRAM scaling faults from view of the host, right? So this had s- several problems. First, as we just saw, the sec a sec code does not meet the reliability requirement. So this is where you're putting the R, the A, and the S together, right? So it does not meet the R requirement, the reliability requirement. Not the, the host ECC not knowing what the NDRAM ECC is doing, the lack of transparency does not meet your availability and serviceability requirements. You know, those uh, fault management, error management things I talked about um, you know, earlier on, those things would be handicapped if you don't know what the NDRAM ECC is doing, right? So that's a problem. And the third thing is, um, when you have a single error correct code, and now that we have seen that better, stronger error correction is a good thing to have, and if you have a host ECC, which doesn't know what the Indira ECC is doing, and it's trying to also correct bits, you have a risk of aliasing, right? So you have the risk of miscorrecting some multi-bit fault, and then you could get, instead of getting the stronger correction, you could have, you know, miscorrected data. That's a risk, you know, that, and when you have two correcting codes like this, it's really hard to the reason about what ECC should we do, right? It becomes really problematic, right? So this seemed problematic, and we wanted to, um, you know, uh, sort of, you know, as an industry, improve upon this design, right? So um, again, I should say that DRAM ECC and DRAM RAS are not new. There have been a lot of research papers written on this by the broader technical community, and we said, hey, there's a lot of good ideas out there, you know, in the literature. Let's go and look at, you know, um, no, let's let's go look at the research and see if there are some ideas we can actually leverage, right? Um, First is not really a research idea. We just said, hey, okay, great. You have 48 check bits total. Great. You, you, why don't you just give us, why don't you just give all those 48 check bits now to the host? Don't worry about the NDRAM ECC, right? And now, you know, we acknowledge that there's you know, DRAM reliability has problems, you know, that's a technical issue. You know, don't worry about it. Just give us those 48 check bits to the host. And you know, with more check bits, you can, you know, do a stronger ECC, right? Um, so there are some advantages to it, right? You can implement your ECC. So you have the logic process on the host, you have the DRAM process um, in the DRAM, right? So, and, you know, implementing anything in the logic process as we have always done ECC is a lower cost. And, you know, with the more check bits, you can do a stronger ECC. The problem was that um, if you reveal, there was a concern, right, you know, within industry that if you reveal all the DRAM scaling faults to the host, that is a problem, and you know that was a concern, right? There, you know, again, when you have a broad industry standard, and when you have there are different points of view, right? Um, and when there are concerns being echoed like that, right? You know, one has to factor that in into consideration, right? So even though you could do that technically, that is a solution. Um, the visibility of DRAM scaling falls to the host was was a blocker, right? To go in that direction. Um, and you know, again, we have to work in a you know for an industry standard, right? You know, you, you know, industry has to come together. So, so that, this I would say is the first example in the stock of a technical. A, there's a potential technical solution, but you know, there are some logistical or business considerations which also has to get factored in in order for a practical adoption of a scheme, right? But at the same time, this doesn't mean that there is no problem to solve. Obviously, there is a problem that has to be solved here technically, right? So the other idea we looked at is this idea called Z, right? So this is a paper which was published at ISCA. This is joint work by Georgia Tech and, uh, and, and AMD, right? So there's this idea called Z. Um, and, and the idea of Z is that um, you do have a two-level ECC scheme, right? You have an Indira ECC um, and you have a host ECC. And the idea here is that your Indira ECC is a detection code, like a CRC or a cyclic redundancy check. So and any time you are detecting a fault, be it a single bit fault or a, you know really any kind of fault, it should really ideally be any any type of fault happening within a DRAM die. You signal the host in real time and let them know that you detected a fault. And based upon that information, the host ECC can you know take the check bits that it has, 
um, and then do something about it, right? So this is a really neat idea um, because it gives you transparency, right? Um, with this real-time signaling. And when you have a detection code on the DRAM device and maybe a correction code on the host, you now have separation of concerns of those two ECC schemes. That's actually really nice because it avoids aliasing problems and you know the two ECCs can do their own thing. The problem with this scheme, again, for it to have been where HPM3 went, uh, could have gone, is that um, even though it has these nice properties, again, for this scheme to actually work correctly, the every single detected fault by the Indira E60 has to be signaled to the host which means that you can actually, um, um, you know, you can measure the DRAM scaling fault rate of a given memory device, um, for, you know, from a given vendor, um, and you can have, you can measure that, um, right? And that was again, the same concern as the previous scheme, right? Um, and you're taking away some check bits because the detection within the 48, if you take away some check bits uh, for the NDRAM ECC, you're left with now fewer check bits than this previous case. Um, so that reduces maybe your correction capability, right? Uh, but at the same time, it has some positive properties uh, like um, uh, the, the, you know, the Z paper, right? And another idea uh, is this idea known as DUO. So this is an idea which came out of UT Austin um, at HPC 2018 is that, um, again, you have an Indira ECC, you have a host ECC, um, but you, have, you, can, you can then explore cooperative ECC schemes where the check bits are, um, you know, either the ECC is coordinated or you take the combination of check bits and then you know, construct some strong ECC schemes, right? Um, again, you, you get the transparency property because for it to work, you need access to the bits um, or need to have um, knowledge of what the NDRAM ECC is exactly doing. Um, and it provides you the ability to actually uh, get, you know, get a strong ECC that you could have um, in the previous case as well. Again, the problem in going down this path was that DRAM scaling falls are visible at the host and that was, um, um, that was not considered okay um, um, as a practical solution. Um, and they, again, the problem is the moment you have ECCs that have to coordinate where one ECC is implemented on a DRAM device, another ECC is implemented on an SOC, that becomes really hard to standardize because somehow what that means is that either um, you have to start knowing the properties of a DRAM ECC implementation, or the DRAM may need to start knowing the properties of an SOC implementation, but so many DRAM, um, you know, it, again, in a memory standard, you have so many different DRAM uh, design companies, you have so many different SOC companies, it becomes a little hard to standardize um, from practical sense, right? So, so, the, so the end result is, you know, there were a bunch of ideas out there, you know, uh, good ideas in the literature, but directly taking those ideas and saying, this is what HPM3 would be had various blockers, right, um, to do it. So, so you know, we, so this was an exercise we did collaboratively and we said, okay, so what does it, so if you take stock of the situation, um, what is it actually, what can we do and what can we not do, right? And what are the bounding boxes within which an HPM3 solution could work? So clearly we wanted to get everybody agreed, right? Um, that we want to get quantifiably better RAS than HPM2. We don't want that blue curve, which looked like that, right? You know, we want that blue curve to just come closer to the orange curve, if you can, in a practical and cost-effective way. The, you have a total of 48 um, check bits. That's your storage budget for doing any ECC scheme. That's, so, so we had, you know, given that that was a glide path anyway, right? So that was an agreement. An Indian ECC ECC is required, and it has to be able to correct at least single bit faults, right? So basically it has to be able to correct at least these scaling faults. So a detection only code in DRAM ECC was not okay. Um, getting worse fast than HPM2 is not okay, right? You don't wanna go backwards, right? Um, you really wanna go forward and you need transparency, right? Just having an NDRAM ECC and not knowing what the what it's doing is also not okay from a system design perspective, right? So these different, so, you know, we have now a mix of different requirements. Um, so a few other requirements, right? Um, again, the pins in DRAM are precious resources, right? And again, one of the things we have we had to work with um, is the fact is that you cannot add any DRAM pins solely for RAS purposes, right? Um, so we had to, um, you know, as a practical constraint, think about ways to do all of, you know, get all these properties without actually increasing the pin count on the DRAM. And it's not just error correction, right? Error detection is extremely important. So when you are deploying a very large amount of 
DRAM at scale, you want to make sure that you don't miss any fault, like a multi-bit fault. You don't detect it and ends up causing silent data corruption, right? So that cannot happen either. You need very good detection coverage, right? So you had lots of these different requirements we had to reconcile um, and still you know, move the needle, move the you know, advanced industry forward, right? So, so how did we do, how, so what is the solution that we did? So we sort of went back to the, to the drawing board, right? Going back to some of the earlier slides, if you look at a DRAM die, we said, okay, there are these different fault boundaries, right? Um, and you know, depending upon which, where a fault happens at which boundary, it would impact you know, either one or more bits, right? So if it, for example, impacts um, like a bit line sense amplifier, that's a single bit fault. If it impacts something like a contact on a subword line driver, like it, 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 you know, it, it sort of affects one of the arms of a subword line driver, um, it will impact a group of bits, which is all the bits which are attached to that subword, to, to that subword line arm, right? But if it brings down the whole subword line driver, right, the left arm and the right arm, all the bits to that would basically have a fault in them, right? So instead of saying to, um, so the way we sort of, you know, sort of asked a question is we went back to the DRAM design again, as a virtue of sort of, you know, collaborating with the DRAM industry, right? And we said, hey, can we think about this problem differently? Can you design the DRAM in such a way that you can limit the number of bits impacted by a fault, right? And can you limit it to a number? which is small enough that you could actually make them correctable in some sort of a way, right? So this is, so really asked a question, which is you can think of it as a core design of DRAM, of the DRAM die and the ECC scheme, right? So we wanted to explore that, right? So the way to think about it is like, for example, if you want, let's say a fall in this point where hopefully my laser pointer is seen to impact no more than let's say X bits, right? right? What that means is that you design the, 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 the DRAM die in such a way that if you have a failure at this point, the number of bits affected, like the, 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 the span of that, uh, that component is no more than X, right? So that's a question of designing the DRAM die. So how do, we, how, do we do, like, how do we do this, right? So this is where going back to the statistics of the field data was really useful, right? So the, if you looked at it, so single bit and single column falls are taken care of by a SEC scheme, right? Now, if you have an overlap with a DRAM scaling fault, um, obviously you have an uncorrectable error, right? But then the next fault boundary above that are these row faults, right? So in DDR3, you can see here these blue regions on this curve here, right? Does the next, I would say the next larger un, but uncorrectable fault boundary with the SEC ECC scheme, and so we wanted to see, so that seemed like a, um, you know, a, an, an opportunity to go look at, right? So we, um, so, you know, we collaborated uh, with, the, with the DRAM industry to sort of understand, can you repartition the DRAM die? Like if I go back to this image here, right? Can you repartition the die such that, you, you know, you shrink the mats, you add more drivers in and contacts in and you sort of, you know, you re-architect your, um, your hierarchy of DRAM interconnects in such a way that if you actually end up with a, a row fault, the row fault is actually correctable, right? And in sort of looking at the, um, working with the industry in more detail, what we found is that most of these row faults, right, um, are really the subword line arm faults. So these are faults where, you know, you have this left arm and right arm. Most of these row faults are faults which are effectively one of the arms of a subword line driver. And, um, and, and of course, repartitioning like this is an area penalty, right? Doesn't, there's no free lunch in anything, right? So it, it involves some area penalties, but you know, what, what in sort of working through the analysis, uh, what was found um, is that subboard line arm falls, these row falls, these, you know, majority of these row falls can be bounded to a 16 bit boundary at an acceptable area cause, you know, at, you know, the acceptable area cost is something which had to be worked worked through and, you know, worked across industry, right? So what that means is that when you have your 16-bit fault boundary, you can use a symbol-based ECC, like a Reed-Solomon code, right, to correct those faults. Now, the thing is, how do you correct a 16-bit fault with a Reed-Solomon code? So Reed-Solomon codes, like, or BCH, because symbol-based codes, you need twice the number of check bits as the bits you're trying to correct. So 16-bit fault boundary, you need 32 check bits, right? Hmm, where do we find 32 check bits from? Hey, you had 32 check bits all along as your external ECC code, right? So 
out of the 48 check bits, you already have 32 check bits, right? So, so you can now, you know, debit that from your 48, right? So 42, uh, I mean, um, you know, 48 check bits, total 32 check bits can be used uh, with a resolvement code to correct such faults, right? Which leaves out 16 check bits remaining. The question is, what do we do with them, right? So as I said, right, correction is one side of the picture. Detection is, you know, equally important, right? And, and I would say detection, making sure that you don't have a detection escape is extremely important at scale, right? And really, if you think about the detection that you can get with a sort of a two-level ECC scheme is really that you have your NDRAM ECC, which will have some detection capability. You have your host ECC, which, you know, let, you know which could, whatever that may be, that'll have some detection capability. The detection coverage you get, right, or you can think of it as the probability of, um, of detection or, you know, one minus that if you want, right? This really depends upon whether there's a fault which evades detection here and evades detection here and makes it out to the, you know, the tip of the arrow, right? So we wanted to see, um, again, we wanted to see at scale uh, what is possible here, right? So we, again, we, we worked with the memory industry, right? We collaborated with them to see like, you know, the, 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 if, you, if your India MECC is now like a, like a Reed Solomon correction code, right? That has some detection capability. The, the thing that makes sense to do is to treat this host ECC as a, um, as a detection code now, because again, you, the separation of concerns of detection and correction is a nice thing to have, uh, just like that Z idea, right? Um, except that this is turned around on its head a little bit, right? Um, and we collaborated with them to see how many bits do you really need for a host for a host ECC to be viable. And the viability was really two different ways to think about the viability, right? One is you need to have very high detection coverage. That's a technical quantitative statement, right? You're a DRAM um, manufacturer. The host ECC is on the SOC. That is implemented by an SOC uh, manufacturer. There are many DRAM manufacturers, there are many SOC manufacturers. We are all in JEDEC, we are all interested in you know, HBM, right? So the you really want to have, um, you, you really want to have these codes be orthogonal, right? You don't want to have to like everybody sort of coordinate and lockstep about who's designing which ECC for which product and think that's not, you really want to have orthogonality on the two ECC schemes, right? For it, and that orthogonality should be in such a way that it gives you the detection coverage you need, right? So we did this analysis. So, so there was a quantitative study of, you know, different you know, implementations of the Reed Solomon code, uh, of the symbol code, which is the NDRAM ECC, and different host CRC polynomials, right? Because for each polynomial, there are certain detection coverage you can get, certain bit patterns which are detected, certain bit patterns which are not detected, and how do these things kind of um, you know, you know, uh, interact together? And what we found is that if you had only eight bits for the host ECC, right? Um, you will have to carefully co-select the, the CRC polynomial on the host and the Reed Solomon implementation on the on for the NDRAM ECC. That's problematic from a practical viewpoint for standardization. But if you had 16 bits um, for the host ECC, you don't actually have to do this co-selection, right? So no matter for a wide range of implementations of the NDRAM ECC and you know different polynomials for a 16-bit host ECC. You get very high detection coverage, and that's a that's a statement of scale, right? So for everything, we had to sort of see um, how does the numbers um, sort of uh, pan out when you have you know very large you know uh, scale deployment of devices, right? And so what we said is, hey, 16 bits to the host, um, it, you you know gives you the capability to actually implement a strong uh, host ECC if you you know if one chooses to do so, right? Um, so that's great, right? Because 32 bits for the NDRAM ECC. 16 bits for the host ECC. So we were, we are working within the original check bit budget of 48, but we just flipped around a few aspects of the DRAM architecture, right? So this, the host ECC is now a correction code, which is a symbol-based correction code, which can correct up to 16 bit faults, um, you know, uh, some up to these, you know, boundary of a subword line arm fault on any one fetch, or any one 256 fetch, bit fetch from DRAM, right? So this includes, you know, see your single bit falls, you know, if you have a DRAM scaling fault, which overlaps with your single bit fault, it's a two bit fault, it's correctable, right? So there's a lot of different categories of these underlying falls. And, and you have advanced the, you're now also able to correct a larger fault boundary than you could do before, 
The second aspect is the transparency, right? So every time your, on, uh, your NDRM ECC detects or corrects a fault, you'd like to be able to know what's happening, right? So to, so in HPM3, you have a real-time signaling capability. Like so and then I said, you can't increase the pin count. So how was that done, right? And it's really done by the fact is that we flipped around where the check bit, check bits go, right? So in HPM2, you're sending 32 check bits or eight beats, right? So that's four ECC pins or BL8 gives you 32 bits. Now you're not sending, you're keeping your 32 bits and you're sending out 16 bits. So you're sending out half the number of check bits that freed up a couple of DRAM ECC pins. So that pins without changing the pin count, but maybe just redefining the what the pins do, right? We could repurpose them to, to sort of, you know, have an encoding which says, hey, I just fetched this data and I didn't find any error. I fetched, I fetched some data and I found a single bit uh, fault and I corrected it. I just letting you know, uh, I corrected a multi-bit fault, letting you know, or I could not, I detected a fault and I could not correct it. I'm letting you know so that the host ACC can, um, can, can do something about that, right? And we also have like, you know, error logging registers and things like that defined. So, so that allowed us to do that. And you have these 16 bits which are routed to the host. So these are metadata bits. The standard does not say what to do with them. They, you can do whatever you want with them, right? Um, that gives the flexibility, right? So robust fault detection, as I said, is one way to use them, right? Or it can be used for whatever purposes that an SOC design, design, um, designer chooses to do so, right? So it gives this, this flexibility on both sides. So the NDRAM ECC and host ECC can be designed orthogonally, right? Um, and the DRAM and SOC um, architects and you know companies can independently evolve the ECC. So the property, once you define the properties that you can correct this many bits with these bits you have, right? Once you agree upon those properties, the actual details and implementation of the ECC um, is not that important, which gives that freedom of design and ev evolving roadmaps and things like this, which is critical for any industry in a solution. Um, I'll take a pause and I'll take any questions. I think. Uh, Atabok, I think you have a question. Yeah, I do. Uh, so in one of the earlier slides, you mentioned the uh, manufacturer, data manufacturers not really finding the idea of exposing um, what was like the reliability characteristics via ECC metadata. Um, that's good, right? But here it seems like they do uh, because the DRAM chip will tell the SOC how many, even how many uh, errors it, um, sorry, it re like basically repaired or uh, corrected. Yeah, there's, there's transparency. Yes. Uh, so was there like a sort of compromise on both sides or or, did, or, or maybe they're still keeping some information, but I, I don't see how at this point. Because it's- no, that's, it, a good, it, that's a good yeah. question. That's a good observation, right? So a couple of things have changed from this to um, the previous one, right? So transparency is a good thing, but now the way to think about it is the D so the NDRAM ECC was in there because there was a concern that DRAM scaling faults are going to be a problem. And it's the DRAM's responsibility to deliver a device where those faults do not create a problem to the to the host site, right? So that's the, the I mean, that's the that was one of the key motivations, right? Now the DRAM is fully capable of handling a situation of an overlapping fault, right? In the previous case, it couldn't, right? It could handle a scaling fault, but it could not handle an overlapping scenario. Now the DRAM, the NDRAM ECC, now the DRAM owns a much larger responsibility of the correct, it owns the correction capability of a much larger group of faults than before, right? So we are in some ways, this architecture is empowering the DRAM to actually be able to deliver a higher reliability than before. But just a sec ECC, so that that is a so that that makes it that makes one difference, right? Um, the the other kinds of things also um, is the fact is that let's say the, the DRAM that the way the transparency, if you look at the spec, there are encodings for corrected single bit fault and corrected multi bit faults, right? Um, depending on what it is. Now the flex the, the 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 specification does give some flexibility as to I use signaling every single corrected fault all the time, or are you signaling, or, you know, are you signaling only let's just say a subset, right? So that is, I would say something which gets, which will get work worked out through, let me just call it through, through the market and the business will dictate how those features get used up, right? 
but the capability exists in the spec to signal everything. It also, at the same time, empowers the DRAM um, uh, 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 in a standardized way to, co to cope with the problems that they were concerned about, as well as deal with the, some of the side effects of the original solution to deal with the problem, as well as be able to advance the RAS uh, from a point uh, to a better point than where we were in HPM2, right? So that so the DRAM brings a lot more value add. So that changes the dynamics a little bit. It changed the dynamics enough for the architecture to be accepted as a standard, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I think I understand. Um, yeah, I, I have another question, but it's not relevant. Uh, Go so ahead. It's, yeah, it's about the um, error isolation in the previous slides where you showed the architecture of a DRAM uh, chip. Um, do you, and then we ended up with the 16-bit boundary and we isolated this uh, subword line drivers, um, I guess. Uh, do you think that that will be the only sort of isolation or should we expect different organizations? I guess we won't know in the end, but uh, this 32 bits, uh, does it, in, in, your, in your opinion, allow a lot of flexibility for data manufacturers to reorganize their arrays uh, to reduce potentially errors coming from other sort of uh, places or uh, components. Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, that 16 bits is what it landed on, could could certain things be pushed to even smaller fault boundaries so that you could um, um, you could do more things with those check bits than what's, what's being done here? Basically, is that it, right? Um, yeah, I mean, th theoretically, yes, right. I mean, theory. I mean, th th there's always a difference between theory and practice and engineering, right? But I mean, theoretically, the concept of isolation could be pushed to smaller and smaller mats. But every time you you repartition the die to do that, you're adding in overheads, which is not. Um, you're adding in overheads to do that. You are taking away some area from what could have been capacity, right? Um, to do that, so that has to be. That's a judgment call that you know, one makes as a DRAM designer, right? Um, now, the, 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 it, it, uh, the judgment call, so the, the reason in, this, was, this was doable in HPM3, um, as well as you know, DDR5 has a similar sort of fault bounding for a different reason, is the fact is that that was deemed, doing that level of fault bounding was deep, was, has a cost, but the benefits of it was deemed, um, and this is where the business side of things come in, right? Was deemed to be valuable enough to solve a problem and be able to, which will then enable a large amount of this DRAM to be deployed at scale to provide the benefits of having de designed and you know invested in that DRAM technology, right? So that is that balance always, that balance is always considered for everything we do, right? Um, there is a, there is always let me it's like quite often a lot of work I do, right? There's always a design space of things which could be done, but then some of these practical considerations prune it down in various ways, right? So, again, we'll, I mean, quite often we were guided by data, and I think that's always a good thing to do is to be guided by data. If we see, let's say, in the future that there's compelling um, statistics from systems, um, real systems, that we need to improve upon that um, in some way, shape, or form. Let's say something happened with like you know unbounded falls. And there's a very clear motivation to do it. Then I would say that you know, we would have to you know get together and figure out how to solve the problem and do it cost effectively, right? Um, so um, that is just the considering the trade-offs. It's a continuous thing, right? It's always a continuous thing to consider a trade-off for this for this for this technology and for let me just call it the use cases of this kind of DRAM, as well as let's just say projections of let's say capacities of this kind of DRAM versus let's say other types of DRAM organization. This seemed like a um, acceptable trade-off to make as a, um, you know, uh, you know as, a, as a broad industry uh, consensus, right? Or I should say like, you know, broad industry, yeah, consensus, I guess that's the right word. I understand. Yeah, yeah, makes all. I would say as a, I would say as a research question out there, right? I guess I can turn it into a research question. If there are ways in which one can think about, let's say, tightening these boundaries or addressing this problem, um, given these kind of constraints I talked about, we'd welcome publications and ideas like that. Or like as you saw through this talk, the prior public 
a lot of this work is built upon, you know, built upon existing, you know, prior publications and things like that. So we always, we always welcome research on, you know, in this area, right? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's good to know. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't have any other question now, uh, for now. Okay. Um, I only a couple uh, of other I slides. I have a question actually. So, oh, yeah. Sorry. Good. Uh, I have uh, two questions actually, uh, relatively more naive than otherwise questions. So uh, I, it, it, it's really uh, intelligent solution to uh, uh, organize or uh, design your ECC schemes in the DRAM chip and the memory, host memory controller uh, as you described here. So uh, I was curious about the uh, level of transparency of these ECC events that the HBM chip actually exposes to the system. Uh, it, it goes back to the discussion of like um, the the um, the granularity of the information that uh, DRAM manufacturers are okay to expose. So uh, pro, uh, let, let me put the perspective in a little bit different way. Uh, so um, in our studies uh, where we rely on the uh, understanding the um, a circuit level behavior of the DRAM chips. Uh, we want, we prefer to observe directly the uh, bit flips as they occur, like without any error correction, for example. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So would 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 this scheme allow us to uh, observe like where the bit flips occurred exactly, or uh, do we still need to do some sort of reverse engineering to understand the exact ECC scheme in HPM and then uh, uh, re-factor re, re the, uh, or like re reproduce the bit Phillips uh, in post-processing on our side? Uh, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, let me answer the question, right? So if you look here, I'm talking about error logging registers, right? So, so the way the transparency work is like you're fetching 256 bits from DRAM, right? So the, the data moves from the DRAM arrays through the in-DRAM ECC engine, which checks for any errors and or corrects them, right? Um, and then it moves, um, and, and it checks for that um, in the metadata bits as well as the data bits, because the metadata bits are stored data bits, stored bits, and those are also protected by the in-DRAM ECC engine, right? Um, now, in the in-DRAM ECC engine, so the, the, if you look at the protocol in HPM3, the, the pin protocol for the, it's it's called severe it's called the severity pins right so we we re, we, we relabel the um, the ECC pins as the severity interface right so it tells you when on this data fetch was there no error corrected but single bit error corrected but multi bit error or uncorrectable error right so those are the scenarios which are signaled in real time now if there was an error correction which actually happened the registers give you effectively the, the, the syndrome information, it tells you which are the bit positions where the error correction actually happened, right? So you know where they actually, you, you know where they actually happened um, uh, and you can, it's it's part of the standard itself, right? It's part of the, the error logging and signaling protocol. And really, if you look at the way it is done, right? What we, what we used as the driving for the baseline is how the memory ECC error logging works on, a, on the SOC, right? So you have like a machine check um, uh, bank when the, when the memory controller is like detecting and or correcting errors, it tells you that it did it, which physical address for, for which that happened um, and what is the syndrome information? Like what are the bit positions? Um, and the, you know, the, so do you know the row bank column information um, in, in, a, um, in, in thing to do it? We wanted that exact same level of transparency because hey, servers are servers, right? Different DRAM doesn't change anything. We wanted, uh, we wanted that. So that's what are in those error logging registers, right? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Very and much. I think I think a part of your question, Gara, is also that hey, what is the ECC scheme which is used in that? Give me more details, right? Um, so in a couple of slides, I'll point you to a couple of papers uh, which talk about to give you more details on that, right? So there is actually some published information on that. Uh, but uh, does it necessarily mean that a uh, DRAM manufacturer will follow uh, what is public, what is as the published scheme in, in the public documentation or? So they, they, um, they still have some freedom to implement some more sophisticated schemes, I think. No? Correct, correct. Um, they, they do have the freedom and that freedom is actually important for, you know, uh, because again, 
there is standardization, but there's also there is also um, competitiveness, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's so what we standardized is the fact is that um, you know there there are essentially these fault isolation boundaries. You need to be able to correct these isolated uh, you know, fault boundaries. The ECC has to be implemented in such a way as to be able to correct these faults using the 32 check bits. This, the, the, if you look at the JEDEC standard, it doesn't like tell you use this H matrix or you know, use this specific Reed Solomon code and things like that, right? There are some, I would say, um, I mean, it, there are more than one things. You can, this is why the CRC study was important because there's more than one way you can actually, there are many different ways you can actually implement the same that you can meet those properties with different ECC codes, which may have trade-offs, not just which are vast, it may have trade-offs in terms of you know, uh, performance and uh, energy efficiency, right? Because at the end of the day, all these metrics have to come together in a way that is acceptable, right? Um, so, 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 and you know, how you're implementing that, all of that can be um, you know, designed, um, you know, uh, you know, can be designed in flexible ways, right? Um, so, so yeah, the spec does not go into that level of detail as to um, uh, to the level that you may want, and you know, those things can be. So, if you look at that second line of the slide, like DRAM and SOC architects and independently evolve the ECC, that is important, right? Because you know, when you have a property and you may have, you may have uh, device roadmaps from different companies, which may which may go at different paces for different reasons. You don't want, every time you change the roadmap, you don't want them to all come together in a big meeting and direct to kind of like shake. That's just not, that's just not efficient, right? That's industry moves blazing fast. You want to enable that, um, right? Um, so yeah, they, those can change. The only thing is you have to stick to the properties of the ECC, right? So, and, and I guess, I think part of your question is also like, how do you know that something changed? Like, how do, how do you know that, right? So, so this is where I think, you know, I gotta say, like being an industry helps, right? Because when you are uh, when you are when you are in industry and you're working, um, you know, coll collaborating towards you know product roadmaps and things like that, there are additional transparency ways in which we can you know get information about the, you know exchange and get information about these kind of implementations, and they do um, right. There are there are more details that can be shared, the standard, but the goodness really comes from the fact that if you can agree upon the the the, the form of the ECC. And what it does that gets you the benefits, the details of various modifications in that, um, you know, there are ways of getting that from you know from being just as a virtue of being working in industry, right? That's I would say that's a little leg up that we have, right? So yeah, I understand. Thank you very much. Okay, I have a couple of slides, and then I can take a lot. I can keep taking questions, right? Um, so the question really is like, so after doing all this work, what's the benefit, right? So this is a graph which looks like um, like the first graph I presented, right? So they access the number of nodes in the system. Again, the node looks like the same node config, right? So the, and, and the y-axis is the uncorrected uh, memory or MTBF, um, right? So the blue line is the same blue line as before HPM2. The orange line is HPM3, right? So really the, the way this is computed is the same kind of uh, analytical modeling Except now row faults go from the uncorrectable to the correctable region, right? So the the, the MTBF gets pushed up um, as a virtue of that, right? So um, again, if you look at it, right, um, HPM3 can reduce the uncorrected memory error rate. So if you look at the paper, we estimate like six to seven X. Again, these are early estimates based upon you know the data we have and you know the the, the time at which this, uh, the work was done, right? So it moves the needle, right? And it you know and again the, you know it it moves the needle from where we are. Can handle this overlapping error cases. You know, it you know, gives you better RAS and HPM tools. You know, so um, you know, so so again, there's the general feeling was that you know this is a this is a good thing to have, right? To move the needle in this direction, right? Um, and again, this is just my last slide, right? So again, yeah, HPM three is expected to give or HPM two, but really, I'd say that um, there's really two key things I want to emphasize here, right? One is this work happened as a result of two very important things coming together, right? One is prior research done by the broader technical community. This includes industry as well as academia, right? Um, on, you know, on studying and publishing data on the kinds of faults that happen in DRAM, various ways in which you can do DRAM ECC architectures, right? So I talked about Zed and Duo and Avatar, uh, right, earlier in this talk. 
as well as various technology studies done by you know the broader industry, right? So you know we all stand on the shoulders of giants, right? And you know that is true for HBM three as well. The existence of all that ex prior work uh, was um, you know served very useful to 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 explore the design space and think about how to approach um, you know studying these kinds of problems, right? So that was one very key picture, right? I want to acknowledge the value brought about that prior work. Um, the second thing is collaboration was extremely critical to do this work, right? So collaborating with the memory industry um, was, you know, was, was, I would say, instrumental in making sure that we understand the right set of technical problems, agree upon them being the right set of technical problems to, you know, to address in this standard. And again, you can't, there are lots, you know, there are lots of problems. Again, you got to pick and choose, you know, you know, where you can make some time within the, there's also time pressure, right? I mean, you can't, standard has to kind of you know, get together because you know people are planning industry plans uh things to do with these different technologies right so close collaboration was key close collaboration has been key in the past as well when we did the field studies because you know it was always a collaboration between um you know the, us amd the the system integrator and the end customer and sometimes the last two are the same right so again collaboration as well as prior work was key uh and i want to point out that everything i talked about today is public so i have um you know, this the first paper here uh, published Cal last year kind of um, summarizes um, of what I talked about. And there are a couple of other papers as well, which were published this year at ISSCC and the VLSI um, uh, symposium, which I think would be interesting to sort of put together what I talked about today and, you know, have a reference for you now looking at it and thinking about you now research ideas to keep moving the state of the art forward, right? We always welcome that. Um, and with that, I will wrap up and I'm uh, thank you and I'm happy to take um, more questions. Hey, thank, thank you very much, Sudanwa, for this uh, really uh, informative and interesting uh, talk. Uh, I guess I'll open the floor for questions. Uh, we've asked a lot of questions, but I expect there will be some more. Uh, Maybe I'll start with one, uh, Sudanma. If you go back to the uh, HBM3 RAS architecture slide where you showed the, yeah, this one, the transparency of events and 16 metadata bits routed to host. Uh, did I hear you correctly that uh, the 16 metadata bits are not really defined in the standard? And it's a, uh, is that correct? Oh, no, 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 sorry if I misspoke. The 16 metadata bits are defined in the standard, yeah. right? What is not defined in the standard is what do you do with those 16 metadata bits? Okay, basically, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I misspoke. Basically, they exist in the standard, they're supposed to be provided, but uh, what is provided over there is up to the DRAM manufacturer, essentially. Uh, well, the DRAM manufacturers uh -huh. have to provide the 16 metadata bits. Uh -huh. The SOC manufacturer can decide at the host DC because this this boundary here, right? This is the uh -huh. SOC, right? Uh -huh. Now this is like you know whatever GPU, CPU, uh -huh. um, whatever XPU, right? This is uh -huh. the DRAM. So this is manufactured by the DRAM industry. This is manufactured by you know uh, companies like my own, right? Sure. Um, and so what the 16? So the 16 bits have to be provided. The 16 yeah. bits have to be. It's stored on DRAM, so it has to be protected by the DRAM ECC. Sure. Um, but once the 16 metadata bits are provided to the host, the standard does not say what you should do with those. Right? It's okay. up to it. Right? Okay. Okay. Um, no. mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, that clarifies things. I think that makes sense uh, to me. Uh, okay. Uh, any other questions? Otherwise, I can ask more, but. Maybe I'll back as a question. Okay, yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> so in in a in a DDR four module or a DDRX module where we have multiple chips and chip kill, um, I guess the idea is we when we get a chip dead, essentially, like uh, some errors come from that start coming from the chip, eventually service that uh, platform and replace them. And if we don't do that, probably another chip will fail, and we will get start getting uncorrectable errors or uh yeah but here uh that is that is that an option in hpm as um well hpm platforms um like could you replace a chip easily um yeah that's that's the question <laughs> no that's a really good question right so the question you're really getting to is the notion of a field replaceable unit 
right? So uh, in a DDR world, if you have to, let's say you have a dead chip, right? Chipkill allows, so Chipkill does one wonderful thing for you, which is it keeps allowing you to ride through that event, right? You don't have to replace that, that, that memory module immediately. You can keep going and at some point, you, it, you know, it's good to replace it, right? Um, Chipkill provides you that. This does not, right? This gives you a stronger error correction capability, but this is not chip kill, right? Um, so we are still away from that orange line. So that's not there. It improves it, but it's not chip kill. The second thing is the field replaceable unit in a DDR world is you pull out that dim and you stick another one in, right? Um, yeah, you may have to open out the chassis or whatever, but you know you can pull it out and stick a new one in into that server, right? You can't do that in HPM, right? Because it's tightly integrated, right? That's this... Um, that you know, the thing that the HPM is basically so tightly integrated with the SOC, it's really a part of the SOC, right? So the field replaceable unit here is really a socket, right? It's a very expensive field replaceable unit, right? Um, so you can't like, um, it's not like a Lego block where you like just pull the, the, the HPM out and put it in, right? Because it's all kind of soldered in. Um, so yeah, that is, that, that, is, that, is a, that is a key issue, right? Um, it is an even worse issue when you cannot write through even like row faults, right? So that so the amount of those write through events can be reduced. Now, some of those things can be remediated to a certain extent. So this is where if you look at the big picture, right? Um, let's say you have an uncorrectable error in 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 somewhere, right? Um, now the uncorrective. What does that uncorrectable error mean? That it is something greater than a say subword line arm fault, right? So you can pinpoint because you have transparency, you have the error logging registers and all that. This is where, if you think about it as fault and fault management, error management, you can you can you know if you pinpoint saying like, aha, I see that there is a DRAM row, an entire row, much larger than a subword line, which is you know has a fault which is gone. There are the spec gives you row repair capabilities, right, uh, which you can repair it. You can also think about it from a software sense. You can do a DRAM page retirement and say, I'm going to just offline this physical address, the physical addresses which is getting affected by this row. So if you have a failure which is affecting, which is an unbounded fault, but it's not like an entire chip-wide calamity uh, event, right? You can still cope with certain amounts of those. If you think about it holistically from a system RAS perspective, right? The hardware is one piece of that, right? The ECC is one piece of that, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, that, again, that's why the gold standard is chip kill. Getting to a chip kill capability at cost effectively in the die stack like an HPM standard, I would say is an open question, right? Um, right, it's an it's an open. How do you do that without taking away all the benefits of um, of either capacity, bandwidth, energy efficiency, or latency benefits of HPM? Right, that's an open question. Right, that we grapple with it um, quite a bit at the early stages of this re, of this work. To how do we do that? And to seem like a you know viable way to do it, but yeah, the field replaceable component of it does make a difference. Right, so there's a big difference between a cost of a DRAM module and a cost of an entire socket of uh, compute and HPMs with it, right? So maybe there are some interesting ideas that you know, in the research one can think about to reduce that cost. Um, you know, sure, I mean, if you think of interesting ways to do, which, uh, do it would be, you know, you, you, you'd be, that would be, I think that would be interesting to, that will, that, that's interesting open research problem. Yeah, it's, uh, it sounds really Thanks. interesting. And, I was thinking of something, but I might need some time to uh, form a question. So maybe if some someone else wants to ask something, they can go ahead. Maybe I'll ask another one then. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think one uh, one question I have goes back to some of these field data. Uh, so Dan, I think this is great. There's a lot of field data and it, it, it's all very interesting work. Uh, the uh, uh, the major question I have is, uh, do you think the field data that we have is going to be representative of uh, the field data that we expect to get with HPM3 in the field? Uh, like a lot of the field data you presented, at least the public ones, are uh, really DDR-based, GDDR. HPM is a, a slightly different beast, right, in the sense that uh, it's stacked it may be running at higher temperatures because of the way it's connected to the soc uh, are the fault characteristics going to be similar with hpm and as a result are the decisions that are made based on the data driven characteristics which is, i think a great way of designing systems going to be representative of what, what we will see in the field 
Yeah, that's a good question, Arnold, and that's a that's a valid question, right? So um, here's what I can say, right? So when we did this work, again, we we did this in collaboration with the memory industry, right? So part of that collaboration was to understand, let's say, any uh, was to see whether that kind of extrapolation going from you know a bunch of DRAM dies in a DIM to a bunch of DRAM and stacked up like that, and you know every, every DRAM a DRAM die is a DRAM die. But are we looking at the right Pareto or fault modes, or are we, is there is there something else like a there's an elephant in the room which is actually which is you know which is peculiar to die stacking, which is you know which is really what we need to address first, or it has to be factored in, right? So that was part of what we did, um, and um, I, I would say that accounting for things like the DRAM scaling falls and you know, things like that was part of that mix of making sure that we are looking at the. With, with you know doing the due diligence with the best information we have from the field as well as design from you know from, from the from the memory industry to look at it. So I would say that we did the best possible, we did the best effort of that. What do, but it is an open question that um, are there going to be something interesting and unexpected that we may see in the field? And that is an open question, right? That's that I think the proof will be in the pudding as you know, as HBM devices get deployed in volume or long periods of time, we collect the data and we look at it and we analyze it and see why, where the diffs, what the diffs are and what can we attribute those diffs to. So I would say that um, that is an open question. It's a, it's a question that, you know, we ourselves internally are trying to be due diligent about with the systems, you know, we, we have, uh, which, which have HBM. Um, and um, and again, the great thing about being, I mean, again, I'm plugging industry here. The great thing about being in industry to do this kind of work is that when we spot anything um, peculiar or interesting, we, there is an opportunity to collaborate and see if there can be, a, you know, a, a, that can be understood, accounted for, and be, um, you know, can do with it, right? So that. Um, that latency cycle can be can be reduced, but I would say that that's I would say that's uh, but one of the reasons we have published a lot of these field data is because I would say that the having the data available broadly allows people to look at it and be able to come up with ideas to turn around some of these ideas much faster than let's just say a few small actors can do, right? Um, but, but but you ask a good question. It's an open question, and um, we have a hypothesis, and the field data quite often can uh, you know. Can, can do can be used for hypothesis testing, right? Mm -hmm. And and indeed, we have seen with through the field data itself, certain hypotheses being confirmed, like you know, keep chip kill in your DDR always because that's a good thing that has been confirmed. Um, and we you know we have seen some other interesting things from the field data in the past, and mm -hmm. that has driven changes in various ways. So yeah, I think we'll see, right? Okay, sounds good. Any other questions from others? Maybe I'll ask another one then. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, building on what we have uh, just discussed, uh, I, uh, and one thing that, uh, maybe this is also a research question going into the future, but one thing that worries me is the temperature at which these devices would be running, right? And, in general, uh, because of the tight integration, uh, not just the DRAM dies, but tight integration with an SOC, with a GPU, for example, right? That uh, is already a very powerful device. Uh, and I know you specifically not uh, looked at uh, like refresh issues in HPM, but uh, what, what do you think uh, will happen to refresh in HPM and uh, how will that affect potentially retention failures? How will that affect VRT, especially at the temperatures these might be running at? Yeah, no, that's a good question, right? So I didn't explicitly talk about temperature here, but that is factored into account in, in, in the sense that, um, I mean, there are like, you know, um, projections of, you know, when you start, you know, some X number of, you know, eight high, 12 high stacks on an SOC, what kind of temperature can you expect uh, to, you know, out of these things? And are these devices rated? Like all these properties I'm talking about, are they rate? You know, do they are they rated for that? Right. So it's a partly a quality issue. It's a partly a reliability issue, right? And so in generally, right. So if you look at these devices, they are um, 
there, there are like ratings on like, you know, this is the highest temperatures you can run. You can run on these things for, in order, and you know, when you do that, this is what you'll get as failure Pareto's, or this is what you can expect as, you know, the refresh rates you need to be setting uh, for doing. So that is all, I would say, part of the, the, the spec development as well as the product development, which I, I would say some of it is spec, but really product development, which obviously happens with these, right? So again, working in industry, there is actually a very tight coordination between, um, you know, as, as we, you know, as the product development happens between the SOC design teams, as well as the, VRAM supplying teams to make sure that you are dotting the I's and crossing the T's and that without any like surprises, like things to do it. But it, it's a, you know that graph with the blue line and the orange line mm -hmm. with the blue line sort of going off, right? So when I said that um, weak cell thing is a region of interest, right? So part of that is also the thing is that when you're running on these temperatures, there is some notion of, you know, can you have more of these kinds of refresh uh, driven faults that are happening, or let's say retention time driven faults that are happening, and um, how within the ratings for the projection for the temperature and all of these things that you're going to run these things and the refresh rates for these things, how many weak salts do you think are could actually cause these refresh failures so that you could reason about the ECC properties, right? So in some, you know, in a way that was accounted for as part of the technology level collaboration to establish the parameters that we needed to sweep in order to make that analysis, right? So, um, and again, we over time we keep, like as we get more and more, let me just call it more and more measurement data from the suppliers, we always go back and keep rechecking if some of these uh, calculations hold and you know what adjustments we may need to be made either on the whole side or from a from a from a DRAM supply side, in order to make sure that the uh, spec delivers, that that you adhere to the spec and uh, what you get is what you um, expected to get from the you know, from the early stage architecture design happened right. So it's it's a continuous I would say loop that loop that keeps happening um, in the, as part of the product development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense, I think. Uh, one, one question related to that, and then there's some question on uh, YouTube, I think, that I will ask. Uh, when, you, when you figure out, let's say, uh, you made a decision, uh, but uh, you find out that uh, you needed actually more error correction capability, for example, in the host to correct for some things that you didn't take into account, this hypothetical, of course. Is there any flexibility in the host to change the ECC mechanism to become stronger? Yeah. So again, the 16 bits that you have, one can do whatever you want with it, right? Mm -hmm. So so you can um, innovate as much as you want on figuring out ECC schemes on the, what you can do with those 16 bits. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's at least that's one thing, right? Um, there are, let me just say that when you have, when you have, let's say, an ensemble of these HPM devices, and based upon things like, you know, how many bits are you really fetching uh, for your, you know, for your cache line or whatever, right? Um, you can. There is some flexibility on that side as well, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, there is flexibility to go. I mean, there is a lot of design flexibility. It's just that um, some of the some of them provide you RAS at a very high expense in terms of latency or power or something else, right? Sure. So that's the that's the trade-offs that have to be always considered, right? Um, so this is really like you know this is for a single fetch, like this image, this slide right here for a single fetch scenario, mm -hmm. two fifty-six bit, uh, thirty-two byte fetch, right? But mm -hmm. there are there are some other degrees of freedom if you think about um, how you're fetching data and you know how much data you're fetching and mm -hmm. how is your system organized and um, yeah, so I think I think there are some degrees of freedom there. Okay, I guess uh, what I was trying to get at was, can you update the host ECC in the field uh, if you have a device? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, it depends on how your um, how your uh, SOC is uh, designed and how your memory control is designed and whether it allows for in field update firmware updates, which are <laughs> I mean, sure. I mean conceptually, yeah, but you know, implementation wise, it's up to yeah, it's implementation dependent, I would say. Mm -hmm. right, okay. Uh, there's one question on YouTube that I'll take, and maybe there are other questions that others will ask, but uh, Dimitris is asking, uh, is there any field data for DRAM fault rates that pollute, in other words, travel towards the CPU through caches and then get detected by the CPU? Uh, 
Um, so the deep, the field data I presented in those stacked bar graphs is exactly that, right? Mm -hmm. So it is DDR devices, right? Th those DDR devices do not have an DRAM ECC. So that is data which is traveling from the DRAM mm -hmm. to the host uh, CPU, to the memory controller, which is where the ECC um, you know, operates upon the data and then um, corrects them. And then because we, we now have the syndrome information, we can pinpoint exactly like, you know, the row band column addresses to classify the fault modes, right? So that's exactly the kind of field data that was used that, that I showed here, right? Um, yeah. Okay, if there's a follow-up, uh, uh, yeah. I, I have one question. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, this, this design that you proposed to here is in harmony with uh, future, I would say, proposal that they have been proposing for, for example, computation in memory, where they are proposing, for example, to activate more roles at the same time, that prob probably will increase the number of, uh, of the errors that you can see. And also row RAM, as we said before. We need to require like a lot of change to do with this, uh, to actually, for this design to adapt to the, I would say, like the future proposal that I'm mean, Okay, Philip. So let me just understand your question. Your question is that does this proposal account for, let's just say, other capabilities DRAM may have, such as processing and memory, which would change yes. the underlying access um, access methods and all those kind of things, right? Yeah, is, if is, is, that, is that yeah can can be easily adapted to this because I think if, if you look at the academia, there's been a lot of proposals, for example, for this direction, and I see like probably to be popping up in the field and then how your implementation can deal with yeah that. yeah so I, I'll, 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 I'll give you one answer and I'll point you to a paper for another answer right um, so um, when we did this work the focus was on DRAM and the, and accessing you know the let me just call it the old-fashioned access of a DRAM where it's where a compute element outside of DRAM wants just wants to read and write DRAM right and the, and the RAS required for that right that was the baseline for that we are targeting here right uh, and that's you know that's the common common case of uh, of DRAM use. Now you're right in the sense that things like processing and memory and computing memory are are, are very uh, are hot areas and with lots of you know interesting work at value add. Um, I will point you to a paper from ISCA last year from industry which talked about um, you know a uh, you know processing and memory uh, and I think the context was. Um, uh, this ECC architecture, right? And uh, so, so, so basically, the thing is, yeah, out of the box, it doesn't work. Some some things have to be done in order to adapt it, right? But um, so, I, I would say that even if the access methods change, yes, the underlying, let's say, the ECC schemes and all of those have to adapt to it, right? Um, let's just say the access method is, you know, half the fetch size or double the fetch size or something completely different, right? Obviously, one has to consider what is your code word now and be able to adapt to it, right? So, if you're if you're changing, let's say the DRAM, the way what the DRAM does or the DRAM architecture, um, one has to adapt the the RAS to go along with it, right? Um, and um, yeah, that's just how the game is played, right? So it will it will be effectively a, a, a you know a different a different DRAM design at that point, um, right? Um, but I would say that what, what I would say is that um, the HBM3 has served as a useful baseline to build upon, uh, to think about those kinds of things. And um, and yeah, so you could sort of refer to the literature from industry on how that baseline has been adapted or proposed to be adapt, adapted. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? I don't uh, see anything online. I think there have been quite a few questions to Dadma, keeping you busy. No, I'm good, right? That's good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, uh, it seems like there's uh, nothing else left. Uh, so uh, thanks for uh, giving the seminar again. Uh, it was very informative yep. and useful. Uh, and 
Uh, thanks everyone for attending. I think we can end it here unless you uh, you want to say something else to Danwa. No, I mean thank you. Thank you for thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you for all the really good questions. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it was great to uh, have you. And maybe in the future you can speak about the future improvements <laughs> that yeah. will happen. I'm sure this is an evolving field as we go into uh as as DRM technology scales into the future more and more. Yep. I keep busy. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks a lot then. Uh, right. have a good day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.